Welcome everyone. I am Peter Miller. I'm a member of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archives Board of Governors. And uh, on behalf of ALBA, I want to thank um, you for being with us today. Uh, ALBA's mission is to preserve the legacy of the volunteers who fought fascism in Spain. And if you're joining one of our events for the first time, please check out our website for more information. You'll find links to our website in the chat. Um, and be sure to sign up to receive our quarterly publication, The Volunteer. ALBA is pleased to offer our programs free of charge, but of course, this is only possible through the generosity of our donors. So please do consider making a donation at the links, which you can also find in the chat. Today, we are very pleased to be offering this program to you in collaboration with the Democratic Socialists of America Fund. We greatly appreciate our partnership with them in hosting and promoting our event today. A couple of housekeeping matters. Uh, this event will be recorded. If you prefer not to be seen, you may turn off your camera. Uh, there will be an opportunity for questions from the audience. Uh, start thinking about your questions now, and we will soon invite you to put them in the chat. Uh, and thanks again, everyone, for being here. If I can add on a personal note, I'm not only a member of the board of ALBA. I'm also a documentary filmmaker and the director of the documentary that we're talking about today. Um, and we'll be having a conversation about all of that soon. Um, the partnership with the DSA Fund is especially meaningful to me. I came to documentary filmmaking through activism and actually got my start in making films for social change when I was a member of what was then called the DSA Youth Section. And if it weren't for connections that I made as a dsa -er, I wouldn't have become a documentary maker. Uh, I will now turn things over to Brandon West of the DSA Fund, um, who will be moderating this event. Brandon West is a labor organizer with the Writers Guild of America East, and we're grateful that he's taking time away from the urgent work he's doing during the strike. I want to express all of our gratitude to the writers and actors who are standing up for justice in the film and television industry. Brandon is also a voting rights advocate and was a DSA endorsed candidate for city council in Brooklyn. He's worked to protect and increase access to the ballot and strengthen the political voice of historically disadvantaged communities. He's organized workplaces and built coalitions at the state and national level since 2009. Thank you, Brandon, for the work that you do and for joining ALBA and the community that's gathered here today on the 96th anniversary of the execution of two good men, Nicolas Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti. May their memories be a blessing and an inspiration. Turning it over to you, Brandon West. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, you know, and this, you know, I'm very happy to share this moment with all of you, um, which, you know, means a lot to me. Um, first, you know, as I want to mention, you know, I'm a board member of the DSA Fund. So just folks, I can explain a little bit of that and then I'll do introductions and we can get started. Uh, but really the DSA Fund provides a space for you know, democratic socialist activists to discuss policy, history, and reflections of our movement of today and yesterday. Uh, so there's a 501c3 attached to the DSA and uh, it's what I'm on the board of. And just to give you examples of some of the work we do, uh, we've had you know, a very successful How We Win um, series. So we've brought in organizers, DSA electives from across the country to talk about their work. And we've physically had a meeting in DC recently, we had over a hundred social electeds in one room. It's the first time we've, something's happened in over a hundred years. Um, and we've also engaged in an archives project where we're arch archiving the history of the organization. This is right now the largest socialist uh, membership organization in the country and are doing a lot of uh, multicultural organizing work and bringing in young people across the country and really supporting them with grants in order to be able to learn how to organize and be able to be part of this movement. So this is what the DSA Fund does. There'll be more information about us later. Um, if you're curious or wanna get more engaged, um, we would be happy to have you. And with that, you know, I'm gonna first do a quick introductions and then we'll get started with the questions. So you've all already met uh, Peter Miller, but um, just to go a little deeper into uh, their uh, background, you know, Peter Miller is a M Emmy and Peabody award-winning filmmaker whose documentaries have screened in cinemas and on television throughout the world. Uh, he's directed the film that we're discussing today about Sacco Manzetti, um, but uh, most recently he also co-wrote and produced uh, Bedlam, uh, which is about the crisis in care for the severely mentally ill, which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival and aired on PBS Independent Lens. 
Um, and now um, introduce one of our panelists, uh, or two other panelists. So we have Ashik Sadiq uh, is an organizer with DSA and this was elected to DSA's National Political Committee um, in 2021. And he's currently serving on the uh, National Political Committee Steering Committee. Uh, he works in research as a research analyst at the National Priorities Project of the Institute for Policy Studies and really analyzes the militarized spending of the US federal budget um, and you know, is an expert on this content. So thank you very much. And finally, we have Dana Moreno, is an immigrant from Ecuador and is co-chair of the Queens DSA. Uh, she, is or, organize, she has organized immigrant workers throughout her career, most recently as deputy director of the New Immigrant Community Empowerment um, Organization and is an immigrant rights nonprofit uh, focused on political education and job training for undocumented workers. Uh, she currently works as a communications manager for the New York State Nurses Association, which is a labor union representing over 42,000 healthcare workers in New York State. So thank you. Uh, these are our great panelists today. And, you know, we obviously this event is designed, you should have been able to chance to watch the documentary on your own. Uh, if you're if I have a feeling if I was on the other side, I'd be one of those people who didn't quite finish the documentary, but still wanted to come. So by all means, still do that. Uh, but we're going to really get started with a, a group of questions about uh, this really great documentary that I know I um, really appreciate and had developed a lot of feelings and thoughts after watching it. Um, so really first, um, I want to just go straight to Peter and real basic question, you know, and really ask, like, if you can talk briefly about why you made this film. And when you discuss that question, you know, and answer why, go a bit into how you feel that your opinion of your work, your documentary that you made in itself has changed over time. Um, you know, would there be anything different you would have made in this movie if, if you were making it the first time now um, after, you know, the reflection that you had? So if you want to go into that, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Uh, the story of Sacco and Vanzetti is something that I knew a little bit about, and I knew that it was a story from American radical history that needed to be told. Um, and after finishing my first documentary about the song, The Internationale, um, was thinking, you know, maybe the next one should be about this historic injustice. Um, and together with my filmmaking partner, Amy Linton, started embarking on this journey. But what I realized soon after starting was that while this is a story about historical injustice and about uh, you know, a terrible criminal trial and about the mistreatment of immigrants and about um, you know just some of the problems of the administration of justice in the United States. It, at its heart was a story of two human beings. Uh, Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti were remarkable people and among and the, you know um, the, one of the reasons why millions of people marched on their behalf was because people got the sense of who they were as people. And Sacco and Vanzetti wrote prodigiously from their jail cells during the seven years that they were locked up. Their letters were published as a book that remains in print today called The Letters of Sacco and Vanzetti. And in reading about them and learning about them, I realized that this was a story that was about humanity, about human beings, about the experience of having something like this done to you and what that meant to the millions of people who found meaning in them. You know, I made the film in the early 2000s. I we finished it in 2006. Um, and at the time, we're looking around and recognizing a whole lot of parallels between what was going on politically then and what we saw back in the 1920s. Um, this was the George W. Bush era. Flags were waving, immigrants' rights were being taken away, civil liberties were being taken away in the name of national security. Realize that this is a story that really resonated at the time we made it. Sadly, I think it still resonates now in all kinds of different ways that we never could have expected. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you know that really directly connects to you know some of this. You know, it's not a surprise, you know, in, in the context of like how relevant it is, but even. You know, I was surprised even myself. I kind of was thinking, you know, go, going into watching the film, you know, oh, I, you know, I see the connections. And then I, even coming out of that, I was just like, oh, wow. You know, the details of the case, you know, especially as someone who works on a lot of uh, criminal legal issues, you know, it definitely uh, is very eye-opening. Um, so I, I wanted to go to Ashik, actually, with the next question. Um, 
you know, when I was watching this film, I, you know, I was struck to the degree to which World War I had an impact on it, and really more so public opinion and this whole idea that the, the war, you know, the Great War is being used as a justification to protect this country. But, the, you know, the immigration coming from the places that we're being destabilized by this war, you know, were a threat, you know, at the same time. You know, so, you know, knowing your work um, and your research and you know, obviously living in the post, you know, global war on terror, you know, I wanted to hear your thoughts in terms of like what, when you watch the film and like how you think this connects, you know, how immigration connects and, you know, these realities and foreign policy connects uh, in the current current form. Yeah, great question. So what, what this documentary really, documentary really brought out for me was just what an unusually multicultural time in America I, I grew up in. Like I, I came of age in the 1990s in New York City um, in the public school system where, you know, almost everybody I knew, my classmates were immigrants, like one or two gener generations removed. And, um, you know, the Sacco and Vanzetti case is something I learned about in like one paragraph in a textbook, in a history textbook in, in high school. And, you know, it was kind of just a footnote. So I think just seeing, um, you know, how, how vividly this laid out and really captured the imagination of immigrants at a different time uh, just kind of um, laid out to me how, how much of a sort of historical anomaly this period was in the United States, like an outgrowth of um, like a more liberal attitude to immigration and civil rights that, that came from all these very hard won movement of victory since the 1960s. And then for a few decades, um, you know, that, that was kind of the norm uh, th that I think I and a lot of people benefited from. But then since 9-11, um, I, I think there's been a, a, a kind of reversion to the mean of, of the United States history. There's such a deep history of xenophobia in this country that is deeply tied to political paranoia about groups of people who are seen to represent um, who, on the one hand, are an exploited class of, of workers, right, L like this movie really showed, um, that Sacco and Vanzetti came out of this whole population of people who are basically brought here as, as cheap labor, um, but at the same time are seen to represent a threat to what it, what is a very exploitative and, and very militarized system. Um, so at the same time that, um, you know, uh, the, the people who profit most from the system in the United States benefit from, from a whole class of people who are workers. They also uh, become, um, you know, really uh, paranoid and, and start to persecute the same groups of people who start to, you know, advocate for their own interests um, as, um, you know, the, the political tradition that Zakhon Vanzetti represented. Um, they, they represented both of those things. So, um, so, so yeah, it's been 20 years now, over 20 years since since 9-11, and there's been such a huge development and, and advancement of, of the security state, the militarized state, um, and, you know, the technologies and tools that are used are, you know, different and new, but it, it really represents a lot of the same. Yep, very good point. Um, you know, uh, Dan, I wanted to go to you. Um, you know, this is something I think probably what stuck with me the most. So one of the quotes, um, I think it was Sacco uh, had this quote, but it's, it was about the idea of like not living in America, but under America. And, you know, I know from the work that you've been able to do, you have a you know deep understanding of the lived experience of new immigrants, um, but specifically about immigrant worker power, you know, and, you know, like I, we've all been exposed to the stories of the past, you know, we read the jungle in school, you know, about a lot about like the, uh, immigrant working class still remains, you know, out of the public eye, you know, this is a thing of the past and a thing of the present, you know, I think for a lot of folks, you know, even though it's not true. So I wanted to like get your take on what you see as like the political awakening of, you know, immigrant working class in this age of Biden, you know, where a lot of the Trump effects are still relevant. Um, you know, where do you see, you know, the new immigrant working class going, where the, this energy is and uh, go from there? Thank you, um, Brandon. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Um, that quote, you know, uh, not living in America, but under it, um, it really resonated as someone who immigrated to this country at 11 years old from, from Ecuador. And I think it really is, encapsulates how a lot of immigrants feel once sort of the bubble bursts from what they think of as the United States and then for what they come to experience. And I think you you alluded to it. We we read about this history. We read the jungle. We read about maybe Zach and Vincetti. If we're lucky, you know, we get a good lesson about uh, their trial their trial in school. But uh, what stuck struck me uh, while watching this documentary was how the the past is present, right? How so many of the themes and the lived experiences of these two men um, are unfortunately 
being revived in, in this era of political tension in the United States and, and, and really a fascist turn, including the, the repealing of things that we thought we, we wouldn't have to think about again, like child labor laws, right? Just in this past year, seven bills that weaken labor protections passed in the Midwest in Arkansas uh, by Sarah Huckabee Sanders, she re repealed restrictions on work for 14 and 15 year olds in Arkansas. So she's not the good Sanders, right? Um, and it, this is also something that's happening now with uh, immigrants in uh, in the the newly formed uh, you know uh, immigration and customs customs enforcement, which is really an agency that we have to remember is not that old, right? This was the machine that was created post 9-11 uh, that just last week NPR reported on the barbaric conditions in those detention centers where we cannot guarantee that people go through any sort of due process in their rightful uh, seeking of asylum, which is actually a legal means uh, to, to enter a country, something that, that we seem to, to forget. So what, what, what we think about as past and what we think about as all the immigrants of the past, which now we consider white, right? Irish Americans, Italian Americans, as like and Benzetti, now they're happening to another group of people. Um, and unfortunately, we see similar attitudes and we see the similar silencing and invisibility of these groups of people in today's um, media, in today's legal system, in today's political system. They continue to be the scapegoats of the, of the fascist turn. But thank you, Brandon, for also talking about immigrant power because we also have to remember the reason why there's millions and millions of people um, it, 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 of, of undocumented immigrants in this country is because this country needs that power, we need that labor power. And that is uh, unfortunately something that employers and the political class use as um, an, an underclass of second class citizens with no rights so that they can continue underpaying and they can continue profiting off of labor that they need, right? Our, our, our meat packing industries, our agricultural industry, our construction industry would absolutely and completely halt, come to a halt if it were not for those workers. And this is where immigrant rights organizing comes in and where my experience um, with, uh, with organizing immigrants um, has really been enriching and, and has been a reminder that, you know, we have to turn the narrative on its head that immigrants are takers. Actually, no, we, we give up our labor to this country, sometimes with minimal to no compensation because wage theft is, is so common amongst um, the industries where immigrants work, right? And it's really the United States and, and the, the, the economic, uh, the, the, the billionaire class that needs us. So part of that organizing has to tie to labor power. That's why I, I am currently, I will currently work for a labor union because I really do believe that the future of immigrant power has to come through labor. I would encourage folks who work in labor unions to really expand and push the envelope of including our undocumented siblings in those fights because um, labor power is immigrant power. And the last thing I'll say is that um, to, to, to be real, right? When you talk about 100 years later, uh, we have to really think about the history of the Red Scare that not only impacted the United States but impacted foreign policy all over Latin America, right? And how uh, really was that foreign policy of the US that ironically caused so much of the immigration that then uh, came to this country, right? From the dirty wars in Nicaragua and El Salvador in the 80s to also the passage of NAFTA in the 90s under Clinton, right? Those policies created a crisis of migration. And that continues to be the case. It's really US foreign policy and labor policy that creates these crises. And we have to make sure that we put the responsibility and the onus where it belongs. Very good point. I, that really resonates to, you know, the fact we are in America on an island over here and we're the only country on this mass it is a prevailing thought sometimes, you know. Um, yeah, you know, so I want to keep going through more questions. I know we'll get the um, um, member, you know, folks audience questions soon, but um, also feel free to jump in if uh, where you use something that resonates, panelists, uh, anything, if you're other panelists, say something that resonates. Um, Peter, I want to go back to you real quickly because uh, I saw and I remember in the film there were definitely footages of other documentaries or movies about Sakam Gonzetti. So I'm sure you probably have a strong opinion of that content. And, you know, but I also wanted to like just hear in general what you your take on the artistic legacy of the trial. Like, do you 
believe that as time has gone by, these portrayals have changed or they've largely been consistent. Like what, you know, do you like the, like how these portrayals have, have kind of developed? Just get your take on that would be helpful. Thanks, that's a great question. You know, one of the things that uh, Amy and I realized as we started making this movie was that we're not the first to come to this subject matter. I mean, from when they were still in jail and they were still uh, appealing their, their case, artists and musicians uh, started depicting Sacco and Vanzetti in their work. Ben Shan, uh, the great painter, made something like 30 canvases of Sacco and Vanzetti. Woody Guthrie recorded a dozen songs, some of the most moving music. Um, Pete Seeger did a beautiful song based on the letter from uh, Sacco to his son. Uh, Edna St. Vincent Millay's poetry. And we, you know, and on and on and on, generation after generation, people found some meaning in the story of Sacco and Manzetti, often having to do with what was going on in their lives right then. And among them was a guy named Giuliano Montaldo, who made a 1971 Italian feature called Sacco and Vanzetti um, that had probably most famous for having a theme song sung by Joan Baez with Ennio Morricone, which is an amazing combination. Um, but we realized that part of our story wasn't just telling the story of Sacco and Manzetti, but was telling the story of what their story meant to other creative people. So we interviewed uh, an opera conductor who happened to be Francis Ford Coppola's uncle Anton. Um, we interviewed Ed Giobi, a painter. We um, interviewed Giuliano Montaldo, who made the Italian feature, and then interwove his film clips into our film. Uh, and just throughout the movie, I think we just keep on realizing that the creative work of other people talking about and expressing something about Sacco and Vanzetti's story is really a lot of what this, our story is about, is th that the story of these two men resonates and resonates and resonates in subsequent generations. Um, and that's just, that's as central to the story of Sacco and Manzetti as the millions of people who protested and, and the struggle is what we all take away from them as activists and as creative people. Definitely. That, uh, just a reminder, that Joan Baez song that she was uh, participated in, I, that was a favorite of mine. I remember hearing that it's been in movies, it's been in video games, you know, it, it definitely pique my interest to do the deeper research. And it's just funny how art can sometimes be a catalyst for you know, our own political investigations, uh, which I think is wonderful. Um, so the question, I think this is actually either for Dan or she, either of you can take this, but you know, I alluded a little bit to you know, the mass movement that occurred uh, with the George Floyd protests. You know, and I think a lot of that was calling into question the criminal legal system and it operated in its terrible glory in this, you know, this case, you know, this is why it's so relevant today. Um, you know, I wanted, you know, despite the protesting, you know, there was protesting then that occurred and protesting today. And like, we still have a very similar legal system. So I just want to kind of like talk a little bit more about that. So like what this movie brought up in your minds when you were hearing about the, you know, back and forth of the case and sort of what that triggered, you know, what that brought up into your minds about you know what's relevant today or what was unique then and unique now um either of you uh, want to take it that'd be great yeah to me i mean the the main difference to me was just sort of the 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 media landscape like seeing how information traveled then i mean this this trial took seven years over the course of which you know there were many waves of um like media coverage like both mass media and like the independent media networks that organizations developed to you know counter the state narratives like that really struck me how um uh you know there was just all this propaganda from from newspapers about you know these criminals who who committed these crimes versus you know like people who um you know knew them personally or were just like um Actually, we we bought eels from him that day. Just like seeing the the narratives and counter narratives that developed, and comparing that to what what happens on social media today, uh, where the internet is so polarized, and how um, you know people are depicted like George Floyd or all these pe people who were killed by by police. Um, you know, narratives are created by the media to justify why they were killed or like why these atrocities happened against them versus you know people who who can actually tell the stories. 
So I think um, th the media landscape is maybe different now. Like things can spread more more quickly. We we have videos of these atrocities that are committed, or you know, uh, things that actually can counter the state narratives much more quickly. Um, so maybe the court of public opinion has expanded, but um, you know, we we have yet to actually have formal structures for our society to advance justice for people who've been harmed by the state, and and we have yet to really build mass organizations that can, you know, ad advance justice beyond these moments of protest um, yeah and yeah go ahead i would love to add to that because um i think you know ashik makes a great point that uh now with a with the video which is what happened with george floyd right like that can go around the world in just you know a day and people are out in the streets to, to what became the 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 most populated um, protest movement in history of the United States, and it also was global, right? And something that um, I, I want to mention is how this is why it really uh, worries me. You know that that we have a, a billionaire who bought Twitter, who is it was one of those platforms with where we could sort of spread information about injustices, right? And has has the power of one man to change an entire platform of information. Um, really sort of changes the potential dynamics for, for the change that we can have from an injustice that comes up. Um, something that also brought this brought to mind uh, that Ashik mentioned, right, is um, who is believed and who isn't in the justice system. That, that happened back in uh, Dago and Benzetti, right, where if, if they were Italian, the, the folks who were maybe giving the testimony, they were not to be believed. And, and unfortunately, that continues to be the case now, right, where who gets sort of their, their day in court, who gets their voices heard and believed. Uh, we still have such injustices in our, in our, in our current so-called justice system. Uh, but, but something else that, that's really important for us to, to remember is that we are currently in um, a, a really paranoid uh, time, right? There, there was a, a really important uh, uh, quote in the documentary that said, the lasting impact of this case is because it speaks to the issues that are alive today, especially during moments of crisis or perceived crisis where the United States uh, criminal justice system is, is really prone to overreact. And we saw that after 9-11 and, and we're, we're seeing that now because we have multiple crises that we're facing, the climate crisis, we're seeing a migrant crisis in, in New York City um, that will potentially continue and be fueled by the climate crisis. We're seeing a crisis of inequality, right? And so, and so these issues are going to continue to come to the forefront. Um, and, and that is why it's important for us to be vigilant of uh, not just sort of the mass movements that, are, that, are, that continue to, to fight back against the injustices, but the backlash of the state, right? And, and again, we, we, we saw that in, in 2001 with the, with the surveillance apparatus that continues to, um, to be present in our everyday lives. And unfortunately, we're, we're seeing that now with the growth of uh, the, the, the Homeland Security apparatus. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't now have a clear enemy the way that I believe Trump was sort of this clear anti-immigrant enemy under Biden, who has continued some of the same um, policies we no longer have uh, this energy and mobilization for immigrant rights. We no longer have hundreds of people showing up at the airport against the Muslim ban, right? Now we have a migrant crisis. And unfortunately we have New York politicians using Republican talking points. So it's really important for us to, to consider um, how the narrative sometimes, we, we give people with a D behind their names a pass. I don't think we should. Um, I think it's, it's truly a tragedy that we have a mayor in New York City that's a cop uh, the, uh, after we had such in, intense protests uh, for the justice of George Floyd, and it's something that we must continue leading um, social movements against, despite someone's uh, political title behind their names. Hmm. Very good point. Um, I wonder another another question, which I think actually also both Ashik and Dana can maybe respond to, um, which is really about the familial. Um, connections, you know, that I think were present in the film. You know, I, I think one of the strongest parts of the documentary was just the fact that you were able to have footage of folks who were directly impacted by what happened in, in, in uh, the movie, you know. So, you know, I think just like talking about like, obviously how hostile this country has become to uh, immigrants and migrants. And, you know, we, we have, especially in New York, you know, we have a lot of New York folks here on the call, but like there's a pretty long, deep history of 
illegal mon monitoring of the Muslim community here in New York City. Um, and then that is something that is still being played out um, right now. So I would be curious to hear a little bit of what the, either your take on how, you know, these communities are supporting each other, you know, in the context of this really difficult lived experience. Like what do you see happening, you know, that's growing in, in response to what is a really hostile climate that's gotten more hostile in the last 10 years um, and, you know, is, you know, it's really becoming untenable in some ways. Like how do people persevere? Like, what are you seeing, you know, what's your take on sort of that side of responding to the current day? Yeah, I mean, th this was really the most touching part of this documentary, just seeing um, uh, all, all these community relationships of how people came together and supported each other against this really horrific situation, uh, like people who knew Sakon Benzetti personally, as well as just, uh, you know, this whole diaspora, and then people in Italy, like responding to what was happening and recognizing like what it meant for them politically, uh, was, was really striking, just uh, ha having grown up you know, Muslim in the in, in New York City after 9-11. Um, I, I grew up in Bay Ridge, which is a neighborhood in Brooklyn that was specifically targeted by NYPD, by, by police after 9-11, because it, it just happened that one of the hijackers uh, lived there briefly, and um, I, I think briefly attended a mosque in the neighborhood. So that mosque and a number of other ones um, in the years after that were just heavily surveilled uh, by, by, by police. Um, there are all, all these stories of, um, you know, just... Um, people uh, being approached by strangers um, at that Friday prayers, just asking very weird probing questions uh, that, you know, very unsubtly, just like, so, you know, how do you do fellow people who hate America? <laughs> just a, like very weird energy, but that created a kind of community security culture uh, where, you know, people kind of like taught each other to, you know, be careful what you say, like any, any offhand comments could just be taken the wrong way and go on a state record. Um, that could be used against you later. Um, so um, just just uh, uh, that 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 portrayal of of the Italian um, you know immigrants uh, and and how they um, you know just came together uh, came together to give their testimonies and then just um, you know create their own networks of information just really resonated. Um, uh, yeah, coming from a community that experienced that kind of scrutiny, um, and I. I, I guess longer term, like years later now, there's also been a politicization of of Muslim immigrants who who grew up here. Like I think it's no mistake that some of the leading sort of left uh, politicians who've gotten elected um, in in the past few years, like Rashida Tlaib, uh, who's a member of DSA, are very outspoken about this because they come from this community politicization and you know realize how uh, the ways that their uh, communities are, are are persecuted or treated with suspicion by the state or part of a broader politics um, related to the economic system. So I think that's um, a, a longer term trend that's heartening um, that, that you can also see in the documentary that these specific experiences of persecution just lead to a broader politicization. Yeah, go ahead, Diana, so you get off if you have a comment. Sorry, having issues with my microphone. The only thing that I'll add to that is, as as a, an immigrant scholar is, you know, just to it, the the history of migration is 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 a history of uh, finding social connections. You generally go where you have uh, where you, where you know somebody, where you know you'll have a community, where you know you'll have a sort of uh, guide for you know this new life, right? And and that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, unfortunately, that that is only when you when you have agency over where you migrate. And what, what's something that we've seen, uh, one of the most atrocious things that we've seen in the past year or two um, have been the actions of right wing governors who have taken that agency away from recently arrived migrants by shoving them in a bus and putting them on their way to where at, like to somewhere they didn't know, right? Um, a, a good example of that is DeSantis sending uh, buses to Martha's Vineyard, Abbott sending bus after bus to New York City, Chicago, DC, right? Um, th that to me was such an atrocious human right, right violation, not just because of, of, of the cruelty uh, and, and, in, and political intentions of using human beings as pawns, but it's also because it took away agency from those migrants of figuring out where they would start, try to start their lives. And that is such an important piece of being successful or trying to be successful in, in, in a country. Some of them had their asylum um, appointments in 
in, uh, in Texas when they were being bused to New York City. Some of them um, didn't know what Martha's Vineyard even was, right? So, um, so that cutting off of social networks and social connections um, is, is a dehumanizing um, attempt by these right-wing uh, uh, governors to further cause harm upon these asylum seekers that, that, now, that now we see in New York City. And I did just wanna mention that because again, building social networks and not being isolated is such a key part of, of, of trying to make a new life in, in another country. And when that option is taken away, um, it can truly be detrimental. Very good, thank you. Um, Peter, I wanted to get back to you a little bit. You know, we I think we kind of talked a little bit about this and you know, maybe this maybe well, this may be one other question and we'll start to go to audience questions, but um, you wanted to talk about, you know, the power of history and historical storytelling, you know, especially in the context of how you use it to support modern day things, you know, modern day change, you know, this is something that the DSA fund is doing. We have our archiving work. This is um, something that is clearly to the mission of ALBA. Um, and also we're seeing now increasingly challenging time to make historical stories and make art on this front, you know, um, you know, with the way that streaming and the way that you know, these models are worked or being used, you know, so I would love to get your perspective on how, you know, we can use this story as a tool, but also like how we can use storytelling as a tool in this like late stage capitalism moment <laughs> in a way, you know, and still be able to make that possible, you know. It's a, it's a great question. I mean, Alba, I'm proud to be on the board of, of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archives, which is an organization that used to be a organization of the veterans of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, the people who went to Americans who went to Spain to fight against fascism before it was fashionable to do that kind of thing. Um, and at great risk, and a lot of them didn't return, we honor their memories by doing human rights work and by encouraging activism today. It is in some ways, history is a wonderful way of bringing up difficult things in the present. We talk about stuff that happened long ago. We talk about old injustices, and it's a way of articulating facts and, and ideas about America that, that somehow become clearer as we look at them uh, decades ago. The story of Sacco and Vanzetti is a story of what, what America did wrong you know, denying rights to people to a fair trial, persecuting people based on their political beliefs and their ethnicity. But in some ways, it's a story of what America did right. The, the millions of people who protested, the people who took their inspiration and turned that into activism. I think a lot of the folks who went to Spain grew up in and were radicalized in the era of Sacco and Vanzetti. And I think that the power that we have to to learn from history and to draw on these lessons from the past to influence the present is also, I think, something that the right is aware of, which is why they're banning the 1619 Project and why they're changing school curriculums and why there's been such a focus on school boards and on taking history and taking you know, what they call critical race theory, which means actually looking at what really happened in American history and trying to bury it under the carpet because knowing the truth about our history is dangerous because it raises questions about injustices that need to be resolved now. So I just think one of the most wonderful radical acts that you can do is to learn history and to learn what really happened. When it's uncomfortable, so much the better. Uh, and that's, the, you know, may we continue to do so. And, you know, one of the things that Banzetti says, it, you know, said, and which we use at the very beginning of the film, is had it not been for these things, had it not been for the terrible stuff that happened to them, no one would be talking about the these injustices. Had it all gone quietly, we wouldn't be having a meeting with hundreds of people on the internet that Vanzetti could never have imagined. Talking about Sacco and Vanzetti today, there is power in these stories and there's power in sharing these stories and telling these stories and connecting these stories to what's going on in our lives. So read history, everybody. You know, it's a it's a mitzvah, as we say. 
really a great point. Um, I want to, uh, I think it might be good to bring in some audience questions. So maybe Dennis, you can jump in and kind of manage that side of things. Absolutely. Thank you, Brandon. And thank you to the panel and everybody for, for joining us here. Um, so uh, thank you everybody for your questions in the chat. I've been recording them. So how we're going to do this is um, I've been selecting your questions. I'm going to call on you it, uh, and unmute you. If you'd like to ask that question you post in the chat yourself, you can do so and address it to the panel. Um, and if not, um, you know, you don't need to respond and I'll ask the question in your stead. So please continue to put those questions in the chat as we continue the Q&A section. So I think we uh, uh, will begin um, with uh, one Nancy Wallach who asked the question about um, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn in the film and in history. So Nancy, you can ask your question now if you um, if you'd like. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, and um, thank you, Peter, for the beautiful statement about the radical act of learning history. It's been so well put and, and so uh, significant. Um, I, in, and in terms of learning more about our role models, so from history, I wondered if you could expand, or any of the panel, expand a bit more on the tremendous role that Elizabeth Gurley Flynn played over the whole course of the trial before sentencing and after the forming of the International uh, Labor Defense Organization. And, uh, and I noticed you had Marianne Tresati in your one of your resources in the film. And I know she recently wrote a biography of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. So, so I wonder if you could just tell us more about the aspect of the case and Gurley Flynn's role in it. I Marianne Trashiati, are you here? I would be great. Marianne Trashiati is a historian um, who has written about Sacco and Vanzetti and is at this point the, you know, the great keeper of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn's flame and has written articles and books. You know, the Flynn was a brilliant organizer and one of the founders of the ACLU and uh, and, and and involved with labor activism. Um, the she and Carlo Tresca and a whole bunch of very smart people, anarchists, communists, people who probably didn't even like each other because they came from different factions, who managed to get in this era when there wasn't an internet and when it was difficult to communicate and get people mobilized, managed to mobilize unbelievably effectively a support network on behalf of Sacco and Vanzetti. And I think that's actually um, part of the miracle of this story is that these anarchists who are these, you know, head in the cloud idealist revolutionaries somehow managed to organize tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people to come out to Boston and eventually all around the world to protest, to write, to spread the word and to get huge amounts of support on their behalf. And it's the genius of great organizers like Flynn, like Tresca, like the anarchist comrades in Boston, and then eventually the Communist Party, which comes on board and becomes part of this movement. Like the left was, had some brilliant tacticians and people with big hearts as well. Flynn at the at, at the very beginning. If anybody knows more about the specifics of Flynn, please chime in um, and read everything that Marianne Trashiati, who appears in my film, wrote. The, I'll say one more thing about Marianne, um, who's, you know, I got to speak with a bunch of historians who knew this case. And one of the things that struck me as, as amazing was in interviewing people who are scholars and have spent their life in dusty archives reading all this stuff is the level of emotional connection that they had, that Nunzio Pernicone or that Marianne or that Howard Zinn brought to this story, that when they're talking about what's going on with these men's lives, it's personal. And I think that's the best kind of historian who can make that history personal. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Nancy, for that question. Uh, I'm sure we'll probably circle back to this um, this issue. I'm just going to move for another uh, move on to another question I flagged in the chat. Um, 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 one, uh, Caroline uh, Harrison asked a question regarding, which I think has been going on in the chat quite a bit on the status of the legal case against Sockman Vinzeni. So Caroline, would you like to ask your question? You can do so now. Uh, 
Yes, um, I had been asking in the chat if um, if they had been exonerated um, and if uh, if there's any you know people that ever came forward and actually admitted guilt, any kind of deathbed confessions, um, if and if um, the daughter of the victim is still alive, is uh, you know and like what does she think of of them being exonerated you know what are what are her feelings does she does she see does she realize that this was a just a an utter I, it's beyond the words miscarriage of justice i i don't even know how to describe it but does she actually get that you know we were amazingly fortunate and sometimes there's you know the the filmmaking spirits or gods or whatever look out for you that's that if actually it was Marianne Trashati who knew somebody who knew somebody who knew Jeanette Parmenter Murphy who was the daughter of one of the men who was killed at the payroll robbery and we went and filmed with her uh she was in her early 90s and she's no she's not alive anymore um but she didn't know who killed her father and that pained her her whole life. Soon after her father was killed, her mother got sick and died. Her life was really, really super hard and she never got the justice of having the people who were actually responsible be brought to trial. There were, there was all kinds of, the evidence that was presented in at the trial was was scandalously terrible um, and full of lies. Um, and uh, somewhere in the midst of the of the many, many years of uh, appeals that the uh, defense attorneys brought, um, came forward with a gentleman named Celestino Medeiros, who was part of a group of of um, of gangsters who robbed shoe factories. And he confessed to Sacco while in jail. He wrote a note that said, I was part of the gang that did this. You were not. I know that. I was there. And the judge in the case, this rabid bigot, Webster Thayer, um, was also responsible for ruling on the appeals in the case. And so he said, no, sorry. doesn't matter if there's a confession from somebody else. You know, we're not going to consider that. Uh, it was, you know, it was, it was scandalous. And so among the victims, in this all, besides Sacco and Vanzetti, is the family members of the people who were killed and and the cause of justice because justice was not served, uh, and that's um, and that's unbelievably tragic. Um, and I wish that Jeanette Murphy could have seen justice in her lifetime. However, I will say that in 1977, on the 50th anniversary of the executions, Governor Dukakis of Massachusetts did issue a statement um, saying that Sacco and Vanzetti had received a terribly unfair trial, did not pardon them and didn't exonerate them, but said that their, um, that their trial had been um, you know, a scandal um, and officially proclaimed that Massachusetts you know, felt bad about what had happened, which is a big deal. Um, you know, the issue of guilt or innocence to me is kind of a red herring. You know, we'll never know whether what actually happened, but what is clear as day is that they received the worst kind of justice or injustice. Great, thank, thank you. Thank you, Peter, for answering that question. Um, to, to continue, um, uh, I have a question here from, from from Blair Bertazzini um, on sort of the the historical moment and the moment today of Sacco and Vanzetti. So Blair, if you'd like to ask your question, um, please go ahead. Yeah, it's uh, Bertazzini. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I actually believe my grandfather participated in some of the um, support for Sacco and Vanzetti. Can't. Not absolutely sure of that, but one of my uncles talked about it. Um, my, my, I wanted the panel to comment on the fact that 
many of the commentators and historians that are interviewed in the film um, come up with this sort of narrative that you know, this case shows the sort of underside of America, the bad side, you know, et, et cetera. And th they, to me, they somewhat pull their punches and, and they, they, even though they admit it is kind of repeated through history, they still sort of treat it as this bad anomaly rather than the norm. I mean, if we really look through our history, and you know what the capitalist system does to people and how it tries to divide us it's it's it, you know it's what's going to keep happening as long as we have this this system um yet you know no one you know that's interviewed really sort of goes that that far so i wondered what um some of the panelists think I, I, I actually offer that I'd love for the people who are active in the Democratic Socials of America um, as leaders to think about that. You know, what, you know, we're, the fact that we're all here, America may have all kinds of terrible problems, but one of them, it's not the people in this room. This is wonderful. So many great movements exist in this country. And I just, I'd love to hear what Ashik and, and Diana think about that question. Um, thank you so much for asking that. I, I really have to say that I agree with your um, framing in terms of how it's really not an anomaly. Uh, it is the norm. And I think when it comes to the history of the United States maligning the other, right, mal maligning especially immigrants, right, it just it just sort of like switches maybe the, the particular ethnic group every, every decade, depending on U.S., uh, uh, foreign interest or uh, labor needs, right? But it's still the same. And, and the narrative is very much the same, which I, I appreciated that the, the documentary showed this horrible depiction of a cartoon of uh, uh, Italian Americans being depicted as rats, um, you know, jumping off a ship uh, and, and coming into the, shore, the American shores, right? That's the way that unfortunately uh, Europeans talk about African migrants today. And uh, folks who are probably Italian American in heritage talk about uh, uh, Latin American migrants today, right? And and we have similar awful depictions in the media of of immigrants, and and I think it's really important for us to connect those dots and and exactly um, what what the questioner mentioned. Understand that it is the norm, and in order for it not to be the norm, we have to change the whole damn system, right? Um, and, and, and that includes the, the, the capitalist system that depends on our labor but divides us um, based on our, 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 our class and, and, and our race. Um, because that is the, 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 the root history of, of the United States. And I think that's why I really appreciate this film. And I agree completely with what Peter said about the importance of history, right? It'll just come back again until we finally heal the actual wound. But as Malcolm X said, right, we can't heal a wound unless we we actually um, accept that it's even there, right? Um, and so, you know, you can't you you can't tell me that um, the the famous quote about you can't tell me that you pulled the the knife back six inches and that the, and and you didn't harm me, right? And so that's exactly what I think this film compels us to do. Uh, is to remember that past is present and to get involved. So if you're not a member of DSA, maybe this is my pitch that you should join Democratic Socialist of America and organize with us because that's that's what we're attempting to do. Yeah, really strongly echo everything Deanna just said. Um, I think that something that really came across to me in this documentary was just like the project of racialization in, in America and like, you know, the, the creation of whiteness, like in, in at, at the time that Sacco and Vanzetti were put on trial, Italians were not considered white. And, you know, over a hundred years later, like when I was growing up, I mentioned Bay Ridge being, you know, a Muslim immigrant neighborhood, but I, I was one of the, the only brown kids in my elementary school class. Almost everybody else was Irish, Italian, Scandinavian, like people who I experienced as white, but, you know, were considered like white ethnic or whatever, or just ethnic, you know, at, at the time this, this happened. So there's this like race craft that happens that, you know, racializes people in particular moments who are seen as other, but then also over time, like based on the project of racialization, like different people are sort of upset, are sort of accepted into that, 
you know, mass culture or dominant culture. So even today, there there are immigrants. Um, you know, I I know people who are, you know, not white, but are sort of you know like um, ab absorbed into this idea of a dominant culture because they feel like they're benefiting from the system. And um, Deanna mentioned that the ways that immigrants are being, um, you know, sort of nearly racialized or pitted against each other in New York City, like Eric Adams is, is really skillfully, um, you know, manipulating different ethnic groups against each other, um, so sort of like against this politics of solidarity that otherwise could be developing. So there's this always this tension of groups um, in America being, um, you know, e either developing a kind of class consciousness or being pitted against each other against that. And um, also, just mentioning the right wing rhetoric, like like recently, uh, Donald Trump and DeSantis in Florida are very explicitly targeting socialists, like using this this language um, of you know othering socialists, like they should be deported. Which on on one hand is is new and alarming kind of rhetoric for a lot of people who haven't experienced that in our lifetimes, but this this comes from a deep tradition of just othering people politically in, in almost like racialized ways. So that that cartoon in the documentary is so striking, like de depicting these different ethnic groups, but also political groups, which had a lot of overlap um, as, you know, rats or these creatures to be like purged. And that, you know, we, we see that happening again now in ways that that really aren't new. So the antidote to that is is building a politics of mass solidarity, mass organization. Like that's the only way out of this. I think that's a really strong, you know, message to kind of, lean towards you know we did commit to make this a clean hour you know I think we're kind of close to that um time so unless you know Peter you have any really brief you know parting words I think um you might want to move to that but I kind of wanted to give you at least um a second this was your your baby that we all watched so you know I would just say that somewhere I don't you know know where they are but Sacco and Manzetti are are you know I think for all of the, the horrors that they went through, the legacy that they could inspire a conversation like this one, I think is a beautiful thing. And, um, and may, we, may we learn from their example and may we learn from many other examples in history to build a better society in which we are just and good and live up to the best that we could be. So thank you so much, everybody, for being part of this. And do check out uh, the Abraham Lincoln Brigade archive. Look at look at what we're doing, which is the same spirit as this film was made in, which is finding strength in painful and heroic history. And thank you, everyone. Yes, you know I you know I want to thank everybody. You know I wanted to um, you know this is a lot that I'm going to be considering and thinking just in this conversation. I know we could go way longer. Uh, there are more questions I was thinking about just as we were going, um, but I do think. You know, again, you know, the work that we, you know, we were ending on a positive note because we're like, we're here building, you know, the future, you know, and in inspiration, you know, from the folks who have worked, you know, years and years and years, you know, in, to, you know, trying to be who they are and it's this very difficult place that is this country, you know, and I think, you know, the, the solidarity forever is, is the thing that we always say for a reason, you know, it's not, it's not just a, some words, you know, it means, it means a lot, you know, so but in that, you know, I wanted to, you know, again, thank everyone. Thank uh, Alba, thank, you know, the DSA Fund, you know, thank this opportunity. I thank the panelists for taking time of their day and really imparting some really great words to us. And obviously, thank you, Peter, for producing this documentary and sharing it with us. Um, I do want to say that there is going to be an evaluation at the end of this event. So you'll be able to respond, give uh, a little bit of feedback um on this and also there'll be more information about the co-sponsors about alba about the dsa fund and ways that you can plug in to the work that we're both doing um in the realm of political education and really bringing folks into the stories and narratives um that i think are very important to the socialist movement today um and with that uh, i want to thank you all um and i hope you wherever you are enjoy the rest of your day or evening and you know as we said solid day forever <laughs>